Uh, so look, the structure of what we're going to do is we've got about uh, 45 minutes or 50 minutes or something like that. So I've asked our three speakers to just to introduce their, the way they think about the issues in relation to their sectors. And so we're going to start with, with Damien and then Peter and then David. And Damien is going to speak from the microphone, uh, from, from the lectern. Uh, thank you, Damien. Thanks, Rod. And uh, hopefully everyone can hear. Um, I guess uh, being from a superannuation fund, I wanted to sort of give the audience a bit of a, a perspective on how super may think about housing and housing affordability. Yes, again, given the size of the superannuation sector, it's been noted that uh, super may be an opportunity to help different areas of the economy with regard to investment outcomes with funding, and so I wanted to talk in that context. So at First Aid Super, we have a strong focus on universal ownership. And that's really around the footprint that we have on the markets, the communities, the economy that we invest into. From an institutional inv uh, investor perspective, first of all, we need to meet the fiduciary duty for our members, and that's critical. And so when we think about investing in that context, we need to understand how that impacts each of the asset classes we may look at, and housing affordability in that uh, light as well. So I wanted to make some comments in that regard. So when I think about investing, all investment opportunities need to be considered in a context of risk and return. And that, that defines the risk adjusted return for that particular investment. But in the parlance of George Orwell, not all risk adjusted returns are created equal. And so there is some nuancing to how people should think about risk and return and how we do as well. And by this I mean, if there are ways of making a potential return less risky, or to increase an expected return for the same level of risk, then any rational investor would like to move to that new position. And what, why I mentioned that, and it's, it's pretty critical, is that some of the things that the Treasurer talked about can certainly impact the risk and return of housing as an investment opportunity for institutional investors. And so that's why this matters, in my, my perspective. So let me provide some thoughts on where residential housing may sit in the context of an institutional investor's portfolio. And I think more importantly, from our perspective, also make some comments around affordable housing, which we believe is a, an opportunity that we'd like to think a lot more about. So there's no doubt that Australian residential housing is a massive, a massive part of our economy. It, it dominates uh, the private investors uh, in, in a lot of ways. And that's at least driven by the bias towards uh, housing that a lot of individuals have but also some of the structural benefits that individual investors have compared to institutional investors. Now, we've talked a lot about it today and certainly in the current context, housing prices appear pretty relatively elevated and that certainly plays on the minds of a lot of institutional investors when they're looking at that asset class. And so when we think about how an institutional investor may benefit the supply side dynamics, it can be quite challenging in that light. From a risk perspective, an Australian fund like First State Super, we invest broadly about 85 billion or so on behalf of our members, already has significant exposure to uh, investments that are linked to the residential housing cycle. Typically, most funds will have somewhere around 20% plus of their total assets that are linked to that cycle. And this exposure includes cash holdings, bank shares, the debt issued by banks, uh, residential mortgage-backed security market, and certainly lots of counterparty exposure that we will have back to banking uh, balance sheets effectively, generally the big four banks in Australia. So clearly this level of exposure is already substantial and we need to carefully consider the risk adjusted return of any investment opportunity that would raise this level of exposure. And I think that some of the factors I've just mentioned really have moderated the interest that superannuation funds have had towards going investing in a more Australian residential property. Now, there has been some discussioning, and I think this is an important note, that some funds, some offshore investors, have been uh, more interested in investing in offshore residential property. And again, that tends to be a different market and a diversification away from just investing in Australian property. So that's a backdrop of, I think, from a broader perspective around housing, why super funds and, and some comments around why 
uh, super funds haven't typically focused on investing money into residential property. But more interestingly, and linked also to that concept of universal ownership, is the thoughts around affordable housing and how we as a super fund are thinking around that. And it does play across the spectrum we've touched on earlier, or, or the Treasurer touched on earlier, around social, around affordable, and also around just more commercially based property outcomes. And Mary Murphy mentioned earlier around our positioning with our members, and it is a really important one that we do certainly look to where we can meet our fiduciary duties, invest in areas that can support the livelihoods, the communities that our, that our members will be retiring into. And so that is where we do feel that affordable housing is something that we are uh, considerably interested in. What we've been thinking around though is that we'll need to undertake uh, a new approach to this area because again, just on the very basics, social housing or affordable housing, they don't tend to deliver the return outcomes that on that risk adjusted return spectrum appear to support a lot of capital flowing into those, those areas, particularly when super funds have already got a lot of exposure to residential housing. We do also see that there are some imposts, and I think Treasurer Palace talked a lot about these with regard to some of the planning issues, some of the taxation issues, some of the government guarantee style of outcomes that could also support the risk adjusted returns, the interest for institutional investors into these areas. And they're very critical to, to really what we'd expect to see the need to deliver very substantial capital to invest alongside other, other participants in the market and also government to, to try to answer the needs across social, affordable, and also the, affordable, uh, the housing affordability issue for, for new people moving into the housing market. So we are currently working with some of these concepts, and I'll, I'll end uh, very, very shortly, but we're currently working with some concepts to further this, and also looking to drive uh, additional thinking around the superannuation sector more broadly as to how institutional investors can look at this area of the market, particularly affordable housing, to try to drive additional um, capital to move into that area and again try to reflect the opportunity to reduce some of the challenges in that, that specific area. And I do certainly welcome and I'm looking forward to comments across the panellists because I know that they'll talk a lot more about the dynamics of housing and, and some of the outputs of the, the report from CETA today that will also build up the thinking around each of those areas, whether it's social, affordable or just the more broad-based broad commercial housing outcomes that are all important uh, facets to driving that better housing outcome for our members. Thanks for that, everyone. Thanks, Damien. Just, just wait a minute, Peter. Look, I just think that was really important because quite often people who don't think a lot about super just say, well, why don't the super funds invest in all this stuff? And so it's really nice to have the context and think about it and to really understand it. So thank you very much for that. It was very helpful. Uh, Peter, I think, is going to talk to us next about affordability. Uh, thanks very much, Rodney. I, look, I still haven't given up on persuading Damien that investing in uh, social and affordable housing in Australia is a really good idea, but we'll get to that. Uh, just, <laughs> just a little bit of background about uh, community housing in Australia. Um, our members, around about well, 900 or so across Australia, hold around about 100,000 dwellings, dwelling units between them. So it's around about just under 1% of Australia's dwelling stock is in the hands of community housing. Some of that is social housing, which, uh, generally speaking, people pay maybe a quarter of their, of their income in rent. And some of it is affordable housing, which we class as sub-market housing, perhaps a 20% discount to market rent. So far, so good. If we have a look at the scale of need across Australia, and this gets to you know, how big is the challenge, I suppose, that we're, we're trying to address here, there are roughly 420 odd thousand uh, social housing dwellings across Australia, some in public housing, some in community housing, some in indigenous community housing as well. Beyond that, there are around about 800,000 individuals who are renting in the private market who would qualify for social housing on the grounds of their low income. So twice as many people who can access social housing are actually eligible for it. And if we have a look at who's on the waiting list for social housing, there's around about 200,000 of those. If I translate that back to Victoria, there's uh, around about 65,000 social housing dwellings in Victoria across the state, uh, metro and, and rural. Uh, 
and there are about another 30 odd thousand people who would like social housing and who are on the waiting list. So I was very encouraged with, uh, with Treasurer Pallas's comments that um, he, he knows there's a little bit more to be done and acknowledging that all governments have to work together on, on this problem. For us though, uh, while the numbers in the Victorian budget sound pretty big, billions of dollars at a time, if I have a look at what Victoria needs to do just to stand still in terms of social housing, it needs to produce about another 2,000 units of social housing every year. Now, if I was to put a cost on that, I think probably uh, around about a billion and a half a year would start to make an inroad into that, but not be the complete answer. Victoria actually has one of the lowest levels of social housing of any of the states and territories. But I'll move off social housing for a minute because it's, it's one end of the spectrum and the affordable housing uh, uh, challenge, I think, is, is no less important to us. I was just remarking at our, our, dinner, our lunch table before that at the rate Australia's population is growing, we need another Canberra about every 18 months. Now, perhaps if we were some other country, we might think already about where we put those extra Canberras and we might start building the transport and other infrastructure for them now, knowing that we'd need them in 5, 10, 20 years' time. But we're not doing that yet. And so I think the challenge for the planning systems of state governments and the federal government, indeed, uh, to return its mind to this as well, is a really significant one. And I think while what we've got from the federal and certainly New South Wales and, and Victorian governments in their most recent budgets is a really encouraging start, it's, uh, it's got a long way to go. Which is where institutional investment comes in. And I think uh, if governments aren't uh, able to meet the challenge themselves of providing the necessary capital or incentivising private investment, then uh, we need to find some way of encouraging institutional investment into affordable and social housing here. Uh, it's certainly true that we look longingly at um, overseas investment uh, by, by super funds, but you know, the problem is in Australia that the yield on, on residential rental is maybe 3 4% because of our high capital costs of, of acquiring those assets. And that doesn't really compare to what's happening in, uh, in particularly in the US of A, where returns are maybe more like eight to 10%, perhaps even higher. So there are a couple of uh, challenges which I'd just like to, to touch on, I think, particularly apart from the scale of the problem. And that is that roughly two thirds of the people who are in social housing at the moment are single income households. Uh, Increasingly, they're older women on a pension. And if there's a huge gap in the market, I think it is that one, which uh, certainly community housing providers and I, I believe governments too are increasingly concerned about because those households often have no resources beyond their pension or very small resource and no capacity to meet uh, an increasingly tight rental market. The, uh, the second big challenge, of course, is that housing affordability is not just how much you pay in rent or how much your house costs, but it's the lifetime costs of ownership. And if you happen to be renting on the fringe of our city and paying a huge amount, both in transport costs on your tram fare or your train fare or your petrol or your toll, but also in terms of time away from your family and your children, then that has an impact on economic productivity as a whole as well. So lots of challenges there, uh, but that's... Uh, Look, that's probably enough for me, I think, at this stage, Rodney. Thank you, Peter. It, it's certainly one of the themes that came in our, out in our report is that with the rise in prices, you're actually putting more and more people into a very stressful situation, and society has to adjust to that, and we probably haven't done that yet. So, yeah. Uh, David, I think you're going to uh, speak next. Thank you. If you will, yeah, thanks. Good afternoon, and um, thank you very much, uh, Cedar, for making a Queenslander feel so welcome. And what a beautiful day um, to be here. <laughs> it really is fantastic. Um, well, I, my, my, my take's a little bit different, as you might imagine. Um, but uh, I suppose one of the things just that, that the Treasurer very nicely offered by way of introduction was the institutional structures that exist around our legal system that cause uh, difficulties for us, that trickle down and uh, make this such a large issue. The um, Constitution of Australia is, because we're a federalist uh, uh, a federation, we have uh, conflicting laws, if you like, that give us uh, quite uh, 
evil problems um, or perverse incentives. Um, and one of these is, of course, around the taxation system, which is what I've written about in Chapter 5. Um, the federal-state divide, um, as putting aside the, the, the politics um, and the difficulties in, in agreeing on, on social policy, the federal-state divide around taxation is, is a, a bit of a problem for us. Um, and because it is a, a complex problem, um, it is one that is very difficult, if not impossible, to unravel. And so, because of that, because the, the federal government, for example, levies income tax and is responsible in, uh, as part of that for capital gains tax, um, that, that gives it a set of incentives. And, of course, state governments um, have their own incentives uh, around stamp duty and land tax. Um, the state governments have the right, as it happens, to levy income tax, and I think they might have been invited to do that by the, by the uh, Prime Minister recently, and they wisely declined. But the, the difficulties around how, it's ta how uh, property is taxed and the rewards, the incentives, um, as well as the costs, are significant. And so I was actually very uh, pleased to hear the, the uh, removal of stamp duty on first home buyers here, uh, up to $600,000. I thought that was, I think that's a fantastic initiative. Um, and not giving stamp duty relief to investors, I think is also fair enough. In fact, it's been removed by this government in Victoria. Um, I suppose the other thing to, uh, in, in, in this context then, we have this, we have a failure, if you like, for um, bipartisan support of what I think is, I don't, sorry, I must say, disclose first of all, that I don't think we have I don't see it as a crisis per se today, but I think this is a big, big problem for us in the longer run. And the reason I think it's a, a large problem for us in the longer run is because of the way that the wealth is being redistributed through the taxation system. Now, I, I, if you take a look at the United States, the top 1% of the one percenters uh, effectively have a, a remarkable amount of uh, wealth compared to the rest of the United States. So they, that top 1% of the 1% have more wealth than half of the population of the United States. Um, and that's okay, um, of course, provided that that money is reinvested back into the economy. Um, but what isn't okay about it, and already this is showing in the United States, is that the people who are in the low, lower to middle class brackets in the US uh, were the people that used to have the strongest wage and income growth as a sector. Those people in recent times, since the GFC, their, their capacity to produce that is dropping, it's diminishing rapidly, and the one percenters are, uh, the one percent of the one percenters are actually zooming up. So the graphs are looking really troubling, and you might say, well, so what, that's the United States of America, and uh, my response to that is, well, I think that's our problem as well, because even though we have slightly more progressive um, income tax and welfare policies than, uh, than the United States does, the fact of the matter is that um, if, as uh, John Quiggan, another Queenslander economist, uh, has said that in the next generation, the top 10, well, the top so many wel wealthy people in Australia will will be gone, the people that created that wealth, and the, 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 the ten wealthiest people will be people who have inherited that wealth. Now, that's fine, as I say, if that money's put back into the economy and used, but that's not what we're seeing in the United States of America. So I know it's a bit of a rough, a rough comparison, but I do think this is a wicked problem if we don't recognise the potential for it, uh, for, for it to happen here, for the use of money or the use of the taxation incentives to effectively um, cut... Um, cut people out of, uh, be, you know, being part of a, of a society. So my paper, if you ever uh, incentivise to read it, uh, really suggests that where the government wants to make a taxation change, and I'm referring to the federal government particularly, uh, in order to uh, uh, support housing affordability, then it shouldn't just be a policy statement, that it should be backed with action. That is to say, for every tax dollar that uh, they raise uh, as a result of any effort, that money ought to be put to one side and provided specifically for the people who are suffering, the people who are down the poor end. Because unless we actually make those kind of structural adjustments, we're going to have a big problem um, in that respect. So I, I suppose that the two big things that um, get the most con uh, 
and I'll stop with this one, but the two big factors that get most attention appear to be the 50% um, uh, discount on capital gains tax federally if you hold the asset for more than 12 months and offload it, and uh, negative gearing. I'm a little bit equivocal with ne negative gearing. I, I don't believe that we should abolish negative gearing um, simply because our laws are so complex we actually don't know what the revenue effect is and the government's not very good at working out what revenue impacts are, so it becomes very nervous about making large policy changes. Uh, I do have some sympathy for Keating's uh, previous policy, which was that you, you capped it at, uh, at equilibrium so that you can, you can gear, but to the point where it's going negative, you don't get a tax break. Um, that gets a bit of criticism, but I'm not sure it's been fully um, examined. As for the uh, CGT break, effectively what you're doing by giving a CGT discount is allowing um, accumulation of wealth that is then concessionally taxed. So any top taxpayer pays about 24% on, on that gain and they pay it in a deferred way. And I think that's producing some structural imbalance. So um, I think that we, we have really complex tax laws. It's made much more difficult by the difficulties with the federation, although I'm a big fan of uh, state competition uh, nonetheless, but I do think it's time for people to put put down their differences about nationality and free foxtel and start addressing uh, some of the bigger problems like um, um, the, the, the long run problem of, uh, of policies that will enable um, people to be able to live reasonably and affordably. It's always good to have a lawyer tell us that laws are complicated. Thank you. <laughs> uh, look, so we, we're now going to open for questions. Uh, we've got some people wandering around with mics. Uh, I'm actually finding it very hard to see from here. Is one in the middle here, please. Just the same rules as we've that Mary announced before, please. Just who you are and where you come from. And keep the question short, if you will. Thank you. Uh, Paul Coughlin, I'm on the board of uh, the Treasury Corporation of Victoria. Um, I'm just uh, w wondering, this can go to any of you, but uh, something that strikes me is that uh, uh, when we're thinking about affordable housing and social housing and the like, is that uh, if we think in a place, uh, and I, I thought the Treasurer's remarks earlier were quite positive, and certainly the, sta the steps the state government has taken here early this year, I think is constructive in terms of the better functioning of the market. But at the end of the day, the state government here in Victoria is the state's largest landlord. It's its state's largest landowner. Uh, and I sort of wonder, and, and I think probably something similar applies up in Sydney as well, I'm wondering whether the states themselves ought to have a more activist role in more intensively developing and redeveloping uh, their properties, because I'm just conscious that particularly in the inner and middle suburbs where affordability is the, at its most uh, difficult, the state itself, either directly or through its various entities, is by a long shot the largest landowner. And I don't see intensive development of their own land. Any thoughts on that? Peter? Um, right, thank you for that. Look, I, I agree that there's a big opportunity there. And from the community housing sector's perspective, we would like to see at least a third of government land uh, being redeveloped into uh, affordable housing product. Now, at the moment, um, there's some debate about the merits or otherwise of inc inclusionary zoning and developer charges, but I do think there's a great opportunity for, for value uplift to be shared across the broader community than, than we've exploited to date. And uh, I think if we have a look at you know, some of those big developments like, say, Fisherman's Bend, and perhaps we haven't actually come to grips with setting a target about what sort of community do we want to see at Fisherman's Bend. Uh, do we want to earmark a third of that for affordable and social housing? I can't see why we wouldn't. But I think you'd, perhaps that would have been a question good for the Treasurer. <laughs> Damien, please. I was just going to make a comment. I think, Peter, just to, to clarify, we, we uh, First Aid Super, very interested in affordable housing because of the dynamics, particularly for our membership. But... I think to the, the comment I was uh, trying to highlight around risk sharing is the way that we've been talking to government around what, um, how can the return, the risk return bridge be gapped, uh, sorry, gap be bridged with regard to where it's currently at from an economic perspective for affordable housing and social housing, their below market rents, uh, to what is a, a, a relatively uh, acceptable or acceptable return outcome, risk return outcome uh, 
for an institutional investor. So I think there's a number of different components to that. And certainly Treasurer is aware and, and federally aware of the things that we think can help to bridge, uh, bridge that gap. And it may be planning, it may be government guarantees, it may be land grants, it may be tax changes. It could be all of those. And it is about how the risk is shared across the pot potential participants in the marketplace to drive um, a scalable outcome so that it's not just uh, 100 units or 500 units, it's thousands of units across regions such as Sydney, Melbourne and other regions as well because I think uh, you know, the numbers that you were talking about with regard to the size of the problem are not going to be affected by simple small scale outcomes. It needs to be an institutionally sized outcome that can drive capital out of the private sector in partnership with governments and other participants. And I think the community housing providers are critical in that as well, just with regard to the support of social housing and affordable housing to drive that, uh, what we think is going to be a logical outcome from a longer term perspective. Since we've got Australian Unity here as one of our sponsors today, I've got to give them a little advertisement, I think, sorry. Um, they've done a really nice job in Hurston, in Brisbane, where the, the old, um, you know, old hospital site is being redeveloped and a whole lot of uh, aged care accommodation, a whole range of redevelopment, not with the objective of making as much money from selling the site, even though it is, what, 5Ks or something from the CBD, but actually using it socially in a much more creative way. So there are state governments which are starting to do some of those things. Uh, David, you s I don't know whether you want to comment on that or just... Uh, anyway, we, we, we should thank these guys from, from Australian... From, uh, well, Australian Super, I was going to say that's bad, isn't it? Sorry, <laughs> Australian Unity uh, for a very creative project and a use of public land in, in a very mixed-use sort of environment. Yeah. Yeah, here, here, yeah, Another question there? Somebody over the back? Uh, Bill Forward, CPR. Um, my question is to Peter. I'm aware that in some councils at the moment, uh, property developments have planning conditions attached which require a set percentage of community housing as part of a development. Do you have a view on what level that should be? Uh, look, we're, um, we're sort of aspirational about, about this. We'd like to see in, in I suppose, larger uh, scale developments, yeah, and I'm not thinking terrifically large here, perhaps anything more than about 20. We'd like to see around about 15% earmarked for social and affordable housing on a rough split of 5% for affordable purchase, 5% for affordable rental, and 5% social. And there's a bit of an issue there, I think, which is how you actually make sure that if you do have an affordable home ownership product, it stays affordable for a reasonable length of time and people don't just you know, capture a stag profit and, and resell. But, um, but that's another challenge, of course. Yep, another question at the back there, I think. Hi, I'm just Angelo Catalano from the Department of uh, Health and Human Services. Just, this is uh, directed probably mostly at Damien. I mean, the superannuation industry now is well over a trillion dollars, one of the largest in the world, and we have funds now approaching the 100 billion mark and beyond. D do you see there's a point at which the sector has some responsibility to devote money towards socially responsible investing like social and affordable housing. And, and by which I, don't, I mean they're not donating money but effectively maybe not max, absolutely maximising their returns just because of the level of uh, capital that they control these days. Thanks for that. I, I think, um, and that probably goes to the point I was trying to raise and I think Rod's comment around my, uh, my initial comments around the risk return outcomes and how that needs, how we consider it and I think how the industry considers it, institutional investors more broadly. I, I think the fiduciary duty that, uh, that the organisation has to member outcomes is really an important facet to that question and, uh, and obviously we need to make sure that we're doing the right thing for our members with regard to the uh, supporting their long-term retirement needs. So I, I think it's a very challenging dynamic to say that we would invest in a different way uh, to support uh, an outcome such as affordable housing. My, my earlier comments, and, and I think this is where there is some, op some real opportunity, is to help work with governments, state government, federal government, etc., just to understand the leakage points and the things that stop the risk-adjusted return being as attractive as it should be, so that we can do that more scalably and try to create what I think is an opportunity to be a, a new asset class or a new area of, of property investing to support our membership and communities more broadly
But to do that in a risk-adjusted fashion, that doesn't mean we're giving up a lot of return. And so it can be done more scalably without having a, a negative impact across a fund like ours or other funds. So I think it, it needs some innovation. Again, you know, we've, we've started to have those conversations with, uh, with government, uh, state and federal, and, um, and I think there is some appetite to understand how they can unlock some more, uh, some larger uh, capital and some institutional capital to try to drive that outcome. So it is, it's a really challenging, uh, it's a great question, it's a really challenging dynamic and, and certainly we, we would tread that very carefully to think that we're, we're not getting a good risk adjusted return for our members, which is a key outcome that they need. So there was another question at the... Thank you. Danny Addison from the Urban Development Institute again. I'm interested in um, probably uh, Rodney and uh, David's views around um, the impact of the funding environment for developers and the development sector at the moment. I mean, it's, it's sort of difficult enough to get uh, projects funded in, in the new world of APRA regulations and bank investment appetite. Um, how do we translate aspiration into reality in that environment? Um, and are these things actually being considered by um, yourselves as, as leading policy thinkers in this space? So, so I think Rod's the leader. Um, but I, look, I, uh, sorry, I, I, just feeding off Damien's point first, I think that it's very fair to say that there isn't, any, there isn't enough incentive in the marketplace that has got these alternative solutions going. So that's really where your question comes in. And I, I, um, I know that, the, that at a federal level there's considerable thought being given at the moment towards the European um, mechanisms of getting the relevant stakeholders together so as to ensure that the funding is available. And what I've said um, in my report is that I'm not a fan of people, of anyone, of any government, earmarking a fund and requiring that a certain percentage be invested in one thing or another. So I'm not a fan of uh, Julia Gillard's proposal um, to um, simply take an X percentage and put it to public infrastructure projects. Um, I'm not a fan of Malcolm Turnbull's suggestion to allow um, effectively people with money to access their excess uh, superannuation contributions and put it back into the marketplace then to be squandered and of course where the sole purpose of superannuation is to provide for them. The fact of the matter is of course that the funds have to have, they owe an obligation to their members to maximise their retirement interest and that's in everybody's interest because the government's not going to be able to afford it in the long run. So the very short answer is that we need to make sure that there's capital investment and taxation incentives that make long-run programs for public um, housing available. And I, I'm not averse to the idea of developers being required, especially where you can point to their internal rate of return as being fairly adequate at the best of times um, to provide that mixed um, housing uh, development. And, I'm, and part of the reason for that is because we've seen in uh, some parts uh, quite unfortunate outcomes where the housing is all done for one, one group of the population and it doesn't integrate, you know, we don't have an integration back. So my view is that, yes, we definitely need um, some clear thinking and some progressive thinking around how we get the capital together, if necessary with tax advantages, um, so that people are incentivised to have this, this view of the world. And that is a that is a real challenge. I, I don't think it's done purely, I don't think it's purely in one government's hands. I'm, I'm with the Treasurer of Victoria on this. I think it's everybody's responsibility and I think it behoves us to give very careful consideration as to the kind of society that we wish to live in because we're not, we're not far from being in trouble on this in the long run. So I, I agree but I don't have a silver bullet for you today. Uh, look, can I direct the microphone just before you do to Judy Yates who actually was one of, the, one of the most knowledgeable people about housing in Australia, sitting in the lay front row, and wrote one of the chapters. Can we get a microphone down here to, to, to Judy just to, to give us a comment on, on that particular issue? I thought I was going to get out of this by Sorry, coming to Judy. Melbourne instead of staying in Sydney. 
Um, I don't think there's a lot I can add that hasn't been touched on one way or another by most of the panel members, but just to take back, picking up one of the very first questions that you know, housing affordability essentially is an issue of supply and demand. And I think if you look at which level of government is responsible, basically the Commonwealth government has really hold most of the demand levers. It controls population policy, population or well, population growth. Whether there's a policy behind that's a bit questionable. Um, it controls taxation, and so I think the very first thing we need that we haven't got at the moment is a federal ministry of housing. That we've got a, a minister that can talk one to all the other federal ministers to coordinate the kind of things that are happening but also to con um, connect with the state ministers. Because as we heard today, some of the states are doing some really great things, but they need to know what's going on. So that's the first thing I think is important. And all the kind of infrastructure that backs up. Um, I was on the um, Housing Supply Council when that was in place, and I think some of the ideas behind setting that up were really great, and we need that kind of source of information. Um, I agree with some of the things being said that the scale of the problem is huge. And like David, I think, I think we actually have a problem now, but I think it's going to get bigger in the future. And you know, we've got a, basically an underlying structural problem. So we have, but we have to do something now. We have to do something now that won't harm the long run. And so that's where I think that Damien's right. That we do have to have some kind of institutional investment. We've got to take, we've got to stop housing being something that people, um, as an asset class that you buy and still make money out of, you know, developing a rentier class. Housing's to provide shelter. And as I see the positive benefit of the super funds coming in is they can look at the income stream. Hopefully we need some kind of new asset um, class. So you, you don't hold housing because of the capital gains it may generate. You hold it because it will generate an income stream through rent, which will grow over time, which will suit perfectly the income streams that your um, people are going to need when they um, take their, you know, in the pension phase of super. Um, but that's going to need some support, particularly if you're targeting at the lower end of the um, income. So it does have to have coordination of subsidies from government. Um, and then in the longer run, our taxation system is a real problem. We allow people, you know, I'm a pre-baby boomer. I have done extremely well out of the housing market by doing absolutely nothing than sitting in the same house for 40 years. Um, and that's, that's just crazy. Um, that's a social gain that should be shared amongst everybody. We talk a lot about changing the tax system for investors, but hey, there's a lot of owner-occupiers out there who are doing even better. And the Treasury estimates something like 50, 70 billion dollars worth every year is lost because we don't touch the tap capital gains from owner-occupied housing. I think another structural problem is we let our banks, I mean, they're very sensible, they're profit-making private organisations, and so they will lend to the kind of people who are the least risky, although some people question whether that's what they do all the time. And so they tend to give bigger loans to higher income households, to wealthier households. And so I can see in the future we're going to, our housing system is going to increase wealth inequality. Those who can afford to get in are going to own all the property, either as owner occupiers or as investors. Those who can't get in are going to be stuck paying higher and higher rents and not being able to afford it. So income inequality is going to increase because you can't get access to where the jobs are and so on. So I think there are a whole lot of issues that um, we really do need to tackle some of the big questions as well as tackling the more immediate kind of problems. So go land tax. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, do we have another question there? Yes. Malcolm Sammons from uh, Park Lee. I have a question for Peter. What is your definition of affordable housing, please? Uh, in, in a rental context, it's generally speaking around 20% uh, below market rent. Um, and if we're looking at people in the very bottom two quintiles of household income, we're talking about people being able to afford a rent without paying more than 30% of their income in rent. So if, um, if I give you a little example, uh, a, say let's take a, a family on minimum wage with a couple of kids, they'd be able to afford to rent a place of around about $430 a week without spending more than 30% of their income on rent. It's too bad for them if they're in Sydney because the median price of a three bedroom house in Sydney to rent would be around about $740 a week. Uh, for affordable uh, home ownership, 
Look, we, we don't have a hard and fast approach to, to that question. Um, again, as a, as a rough rule of thumb, one could say if you're having to spend more than about a third of your income in, in housing cost, then it's not affordable. But against that, of course, we've got to trade off the fact that you've got some extra security, you've got some extra amenity and control and so on. So perhaps it's a little bit more flexible there. Uh, we have time for one last question, I think. Uh, Thank you. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Oh, hi, my name is Tony Tui. I run a business called Super Communications, and uh, my question is directed to, uh, to Damien. Given the fact that most of your funds are national funds and therefore have uh, members throughout throughout the country, how do you provide a, a product that's going to cater for all your members, given the, the local nature of housing and housing costs? And the second question, what second part of the question, what level of support from government do you need in order to put in place these policies having regard to your risk return metrics? Thank you. Th thanks, Tony. I guess uh, just on the, the regional nature and the... We are uh, a fund that's uh, share, uh, is across Australia, obviously mainly Eastern Seaboard, but... Um, so we do think about the, uh, the need to ensure that investment outcomes are appropriate for all members. So again, that, that, that's where um, thinking around affordable housing and the outcome that we would uh, drive around affordable housing um, would need to think about it in a broader context, not just a regional or not just a specific cohort, for instance. Um, with regard to the return outcome, I think that uh, on a base level, our, our best estimate, we haven't talked a lot about the build to rent model, but we think that given the dynamics of um, challenges around getting to the housing market from a buying perspective, that affordable housing needs to contemplate uh, a significant component of build to rent. And um, on our models, build to rent uh, would generate returns somewhere in the low single digits, sort of four, four five, six percent. And um, obviously from a broader uh, capital market perspective, that's three or four percent below where we'd expect the same sort of risk uh, of, of style of asset would, uh, would sit. So that's the type of gap that we're talking to uh, and thinking around when we're, when we're trying to understand how we can bridge that to be, to be a, a return outcome that is in line with the risk adjusted outcomes that we'd expect for a broader investment opportunities. So that, that's the sort of level that we're trying to understand how we can affect and some of the building blocks around tax, uh, some of the building blocks around government guarantees, land grants, those sorts of things are, are trying to contribute to that, to that gap to reduce it to an acceptable level. Look, I'd like to thank our panel today for their contributions.